From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Our top story tonight, local officials are urging Fairbanks area residents to show up at meetings next week on bringing F-35 fighter jets to Eielson Air Force Base. That's right, the United States Air Force has announced three public scoping meetings in interior Alaska to begin the formal process of stationing 48 of the Air Force's most advanced fighter aircraft at Eielson. The public meetings will be held March 24th at the North Pole Worship Center, March 25th at the Westmark Hotel here in Fairbanks, and March 26th at the Alaskan Steakhouse in Delta Junction. All three meetings start at 6 p.m. Nadine Winters, executive director of the North Pole Economic Development Corporation, said a large turnout at the meetings will show the Air Force that Interior Alaska wants the jets here. The Air Force, with a major action, because that's 48 planes and 3,000 new personnel at Eielson, um, they do an environmental impact statement process and in this case it's good for us because we're the preferred alternative. And as part of that process they do scoping meetings which are really more informational, um, no public testimony, they're, they're um, certainly encouraging written comments, but it's an informational meeting where the Air Force is going to present um, the, the action, you know, the basing, and then and potential impacts. The U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee continued its annual review of federal agency spending this week. Senator Lisa Murkowski asked Missile Defense Agency Director Admiral James Sayring to provide clarity about Alaska's role in the nation's defense. The importance of Alaska's missile fields at Fort Greeley were a focal point, along with the Long Range Discrimination Radar Project that will receive $50 million for design work this fiscal year. Admiral Sayring said the MDA received several design proposals last week, and he plans to evaluate them in the months to come with a final decision this September. From Alaska's perspective, we, we sit closer to, to North Korea than um, we would like to uh, on many days, so we, we know very well the importance of a strong homeland uh, ballistic missile defense. The LRDR is uh, critically important to where I see the threat from North Korea going in the near future with capability of becoming more complex, requiring more interceptors, and us having to, and the warfighter needing the assurance that we have persistent track and discrimination capability against that threat. Hundreds of Doyon Limited investors came to the corporation's shareholder meeting today to learn about the future of the Alaska Native Corporation. Doyon Limited has more than 19,000 shareholders and is known as a top Alaska competitor in oil field services, tourism, and government contracting. Some portions of the meeting remained closed to the general public. Doyon CEO Aaron Schutz says he's glad so many people came to the meeting. He says that means the elections held today for four new board of director positions will be well represented. This year we have nine candidates for four seats, three incumbents and one open seat. So today we will elect four directors. And, um, you know, we have a lot of great background out in the region and, and the candidates' uh, resumes are, you know, they've gotten stronger and stronger as our corporation has grown and, and our people have gotten educated and gotten experience. So. The president of the University of Alaska says a proposed power plant for the system's Fairbanks campus could burn natural gas. President Pat Gamble tells legislatures an alternative coal, an alternative coal could be considered after the initial design for the replacement power plant came in far higher than the $245 million the legislature appropriated last year. Gamble says a delay caused by a redesign goal might allow time for natural gas to be available in Fairbanks. Gamble says the university is not an active participant in trying to move natural gas to Fairbanks, but is an interested observer. A North Pole man faces criminal charges after authorities say he videotaped a couple having sex and posted the footage to a pornography site. 19-year-old Brady Richard Crane is charged with indecent viewing or photography. According to an affidavit, Crane hid in a bathroom at a party on February 10th and recorded the couple having intercourse without their consent. Now, multiple friends alerted the woman in the video that it had been posted. Police were able to obtain the video and requested it be taken, taken down, but it remains online. The dis district attorney's office will determine if any additional charges will be filed. When we come back with the unusually warm temperatures, there have been quite a few accidents reported throughout the interior. Also, tomorrow night, the scene at Pioneer Park will be that of Barber's Gone Crazy as the St. Baldrick's fundraiser will kick off at 6 p.m. Those stories <laughs> and more when we return. Stay with us.
And welcome back. The state and federal government say they are closer to deciding whether to pursue additional money for restoration work following the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, but need more time. Government attorneys in a court filing Monday said the state's decision has been slowed in part by the recent change in administration. The new Attorney General and Fish and Game Commissioner are members of the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. Lawsuits brought against Exxon Mobil Corp Corporation after the spill led to a settlement and consent decree resolving claims related to natural resource damages. The decree included a provision allowing the governments to seek additional funds for restoration projects. In 2006, the governments demanded $92 million but never sought enforcement. Work has been underway on a restoration plan. A bill that would sunset state reimbursement for school bonds is currently in the state Senate Finance Committee. Senator Anna McKinnon introduced SB 64 to eventually eliminate state aid and reimbursement of school maintenance and construction, citing Alaska's $3.5 billion revenue shortfall. The Senate Education Committee approved the measure on Tuesday. State lawmakers this morning discussed different education sources in the state. House Concurrent Resolution No. 2 would designate January 25th through the 31st as Alaska School Choice Week. The bill says that every student in the state should have access to an effective education, whether in public, charter, or private schools. Setting aside a school choice week gives parents a chance to look at different options. Even while the options are there, the lawmakers are still looking at problems with program funding due to revenue shortfalls. Education is one of the few things that are, that are mandated in our Constitution, and I think for a very good reason. A recognition by our forefathers that having an educated civilization was so important. So I want to say at the outset that the idea that we would have publicly funded education is so important to me. But how we publicly fund education is a continuing dialogue. Alaska State Troopers are warning the public of the dangers of icy road conditions. Despite the warm and sunny weather, temperatures have been dropping in the evening, resulting in treacherous driving conditions. Alaska State Troopers have received roughly 14 reports of vehicles in distress and accidents in the interior over the last three days as the temperatures have warmed up. One of the highest areas for reports has been near curved and shady areas around China Hot Springs Road. Law enforcement officials are asking interior motorists to remain cautious of the ice. Calls. DOT certainly has also been busy and trying to do its best to put sand out where we know that there's shady spots. However, motorists need to do their part as well and make sure they keep their speed in check. The St. Baldrick's Foundation is childhood cancer charity, funding research to help find cures for children with cancer. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the Pioneer Park Civic Center, more than 100 people are expected to brave the shave in solidarity with kids with cancer and raise money to conquer childhood forms of the disease. This is the 11th year for the event locally, and when this year's donation is added to previous years, it should total more than $300,000. Nationally, St. Baldrick's has awarded more than $154 million to support life-saving research, which has also aided local Fairbanks residents. I didn't really get involved in it ourselves until we moved here and I found out there was actually, actually an event here when the firefighters came to visit Aiden back in 2011 when he was still having some troubles and so then I got more involved after that. But what St. Baldrick's does is they raise money for children's cancer uh, in the United States. All the money, that the federal money for cancer research only 4% goes to children's cancer research, so St. Baldrick's um, focuses on that. Again, the fundraiser will take place tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the Civic Center at Pioneer Park. Mike Bussell is up next with results from the first day of the Open North American Championship sled dog race. Also, Joe Cook is down in Anchorage. He'll have more from the high school state basketball tournament. Sports is next. Stay tuned. <music> Alaska, Mike Fussell here to round out this week in sports with you. We start with some local mushing action. The Open North American Championship sled dog races are now underway. The competition is celebrating its 70th anniversary. It's considered by many to be the oldest sled dog race on earth. Warm temperatures and poor trail conditions near the historic downtown start forced race organizers to move the event this year. It's now taking place at the Jeff Studdard Race Grounds off of Farmers Loop Road. 25 mushers completed the first 20.9 mile heat earlier today. 
Legendary musher George Atla was honored with the number one bib. Mark Hardum came into the shoots first with a time of 70 minutes and 51 seconds. Buddy Streeper followed in the number two spot at 71 minutes and 23 seconds. And Ricky Taylor took third with a time of 71, eight, 71 minutes and 58 seconds. Competitors will be running the same trail tomorrow and the race will conclude with a final heat on Sunday. Tomorrow it's uh, the same, same trail, so uh, we'll do the same thing. We'll hold them down a little bit at the beginning and then let them get into a nice rhythm and, uh, and start rolling. And then uh, day, day three is when it gets real interesting. Can't it's tell. a reverse start and uh, there's uh, additional eight miles added to the trail, like so that changes out. the dynamic of the race. And mushers are still crossing the Iditarod finish line in Nome. Anna and Christy Barrington, along with Jody Bailey, Dee Dee Johnro, and Kurt Pirano are some of the mushers who can now call themselves Iditarod finishers. They came in late last night and earlier today. The majority of the field is still out on the trail. The majority of the field that is still out on the trail, there, that is, will be passing through White Mountain in the days to come. Rookie Cindy Abbott holds the Red Lantern spot. She is continuing to make the trek with 13 dogs. And some local high school teams are still fighting their way through the state basketball championship bracket. Monroe Catholic continues to showcase dominance at the tournament. Joe Cook has more from Anchorage. 3A state tournament action in the Sullivan Arena on Thursday night. The Rams and Monroe faced the Warriors of Bethel in the quarterfinals. Monroe came out gunning, going 3-for-3 three three from 3, and their 9-2 first quarter lead ballooned. Monroe led 26-10 at the half. Mike Cluden scored 14 in the first half and finished with a game-high 18, whereas Bethel struggled to hit shots. Monroe cruises 58-32 over Bethel. The Rams will face Grace Christian in the semis, a rematch of last year's title game. The Hutchinson girls saw a double-digit lead fade away as the pesky Homer Mariners strung together some plays and came back to make it a five-point game in the fourth quarter. However, Hutchison went to the inside-outside attack. Ashley Stark and Ellie Vizi combined for 23 points, and Hutch holds off Homer for a 45-36 win and advance to the semifinals against Sitka. The Hutchison Hawks went up against the ACS Lions in their first-round matchup. Levi Albo set the tone for the Lions, nailing a few triples. ACS followed his lead, and they were in control with the 35-26 halftime lead. Hutch countered with Morgan John, who led Hutch with 14 points, and the Hawks cut it to nine early in the fourth, but that's as close as they would get ACS 